It was really a dead end of town. It was fairly dark. Uh, I guess if you're a scary type, you, you'd, be, you know, you'd be a little bit worried about your safety there. But in numbers, it, we never saw any trouble. But it was, you know, pretty dark and dingy and nothing around, really. Just across the road, you know, four, 400 metres was Central Station. And straight across the road on George Street was uh, Central Square where the buses pulled up not far around the corner, which is now Darling Harbour. That used to be a, a big railway uh, siding and I think maybe repair yard or something. So it wouldn't surprise me if that was nearly a regular drink hole on the way back to Central Station for some old codgers who just go there through habit rather than anything else. I used to work a few streets away, so Friday nights I'd walk over. It was a fairly smallish, old style, Sydney pub with the tiled walls, uh, often described as like lavatories, <laughs> those kind of pubs with the tiling. It looked as though it hadn't been done up for a long time. Never used to be many people in the, in the front bar, usually older men, never any women. It was very much a man's pub. And same out the back when the bands were on, it was probably 80, 90% men. It's um, proximity to Central Station was good for a lot of people. Otherwise, you had to go out to Bondi, to Blondie's, or um, into King's Cross, or the Fun House. And there was just this room out the back which had very little to it, just a, little, a bar on one side. There was no stage, a couple of frosted glass windows onto a, a back alley, I, I guess. It was just a space. The fun house was closing down and the last time we played there it was they were in the process of pulling it down. There's bits of gyp rock and dust and crap everywhere. And we thought, well, you know, we can probably, you know, find a venue and run it ourselves. So um, and we took John's brother Ray, the disqualified wrestler, and um, he, he could talk people into anything. And uh, so we went to the Grand and said, can we use your back room? And they said, yeah, you can have it on Friday and Saturday nights. So, yeah, the Grand became a, a punk venue. We put ads in, um, I think it was Ram magazine, asking for real rock and roll bands. We didn't use the word punk. You know. When we got the Grand up and running, uh, we decided that we would like to try and get as many punk, what we thought were punk bands playing there. So we all um, used to go around trying to find bands and I thought, well, I'm gonna have a look around my area, which I lived at Carringbar at the time, and um, I thought that uh, a friend of mine from school, Bill Webb, would also be into that sort of style. I guess rocks, Rock started with um, Bill, myself and, and Steve, just basically playing in the garage and, and, um, and in Steve's bedroom and places like that just to just playing music we grew up with and, and those sorts of things. And then we started getting kicked out of those places because of our neighbours and stuff. And we, I think we um, ended up uh, practising at one of the scouts halls in the local area, which um, then we started putting our own songs together. And so that's pretty much how we started. Um, when Rocks, the name itself, came in, not too sure, but we'd sort of been doing that for a, a couple of years, just mucking around, not even sort of being too serious about anything. And we were rehearsing one day in, in a scout hall and um, Greg rolled up and we thought, um, oh, here we go, something good could come of this and of course you had a suspicion that we would be yeah. playing that stuff yeah. and um, basically he saw us, said, okay, play at the Grand. Because at the time, um, as you know, Johnny Donald the Scabs was running the Grand so I uh, offered him a, a gig. I rang up uh, the boys and, and told them that we, I found a band and they said, what sort of thing? I t described them and they said, yep. They gave me a date and I rang Bill and said, do you want to play on such and such? 
Well, I rang these guys and said, we're going to play on such and such. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> we actually <laughs> got to do it. It's real. <laughs> and then we went, went there the night before to uh, check the place out. Geez. We thought, shit, we've got to get haircuts. <laughs> so we ran out and got haircuts. <laughs> Mind you, you don't talk about this much, oh. But it's funny to see it in magazines is one thing, but to walk in the door and see it right in front of you, and it's like, yeah, we're going to play to these people. Uh, well, it was, was a thing we were aiming for. We were aiming to be, you know, in that scene. Um, we just didn't know what the reality was going to be like, you know. So it was like you walk into this strange area, um, thinking, okay, what sort of people are we going to see here? Um, then when you open up and there's dog collars and garbage bin liners for shirts and... Yeah, it's makeup and safety pins. <laughs> it's like, yes, it's real. It's great. It's also a little scary. <laughs> yeah, but um, we seem to fit in pretty good. A- I've never found it threatening. I mean, you know, guys at my work go, oh, you're playing a punk band. You know, get your head kicked in. But true punks are in it for the music. They don't go. They don't go to a gig to get pissed or to, you know, crack on the chicks. They go there to listen to the music and that beer and girls as a side thing. Mm. I've always found punks to be very, very friendly like. Mm. In that way, mm-hmm. you know, and non-threatening, and people can't understand that. They think, oh yeah, but they look so threatening. Yeah, but they're into the music. It's music. There's always been a whole heap of definitions of it, and, and you can't nail it down to one thing really. But it, even back when we first started playing, it was, it was real confusing. It was to a lot of people that they they it's almost like they had to have this image. Yeah, you know? they had to dress a certain way and had to be this and 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 sound like that. A lot of it was influenced by. Overseas stuff, and uh, I don't think we never sort of really got influenced that much by it because we we're just suburban. we're a bit of a hodgepodge. I mean, yeah, we're just suburban, mm. like really, yeah, <laughs> trying to fit in as best we could. Yeah, but it, we, the image side of it never sort of grabbed the holes right. that much. Uh, when I look back at it, I, I, I didn't think about it because I just thought it was un, unobtainable mm. getting a record out. It, I'd never even heard of making your own record. I just thought you just couldn't do it unless you had millions of dollars, yeah? That's mm-hmm. <laughs> but one of the reasons that that record is probably historical is I, I think that we were probably one of the only bands, if not the only bands, from that period that actually got a record out. Mm-hmm. With the just exception. that fact, you know, I mean, you've got Black Runner, Society mm-hmm. Blitz and all these other bands that were there, you know, and the scabs. Well, well they never done Well, you know, so in that way, it's historical mm. because it's a representation mm. of the early punk scene in Sydney, Australia. You know, mm. that was a real, that was a do-it-yourself record. Mm. One of the first. I think a lot of bands probably recorded. It's probably why they've come to light of day on why most when you going to write, not so hung drum and just different compilations that yeah. people have done over the years. Mm. The only problem we had... Was um, when he rolled up, he had the word "your" spelt Y-O-U-R, as in like your car or your yeah book or something. We t-shirt, said your T-shirt. Yeah, we available said available tonight. <laughs> all those lines, <laughs> and we said that's very good, Laurie, but it should be uh, "you are so boring," so it should be Y-O-U apostrophe R-E. And um, oh, okay, so he comes back the next I'll night. I'll fix it. I'll, I'll fix it. it. <laughs> comes back the next night with Y-O-U apostrophe R, which wasn't even a word. <laughs> <laughs> <Charger>. <laughs> <laughs> and the apostrophe is part of the R. Yeah, it is. Yeah. There. It's and we not... go, well, at least before we had a word, <laughs> this is nothing. But, you know, the funny part is not one single soul has ever noticed it, <laughs> apart from us. We're forever telling people about it. Maybe we should stop there. Oh, no, I had, I had a, um, Timmy O'Hannon asked me about it. Oh, did he? Yeah. Uh. He asked me what... Um, he said he's had an Australian thing the way you spell it all. Yeah. <laughs> Illiteracy. Yeah. I said, nah, nah, it was, just, it was a mistake. You're so boring, you're always boring me. You're always telling me the way you picture me. Radio Birdman is where I started seeing music. Up in the fun house, I was 13 years old. Used to go there every week for a long time. So I sort of got to know a lot of those sort of bands like Johnny Dole and Scabs and and the hit well not wasn't the hitmen then, but you know, Johnny Cannis and all those guys used to hang up there. And I was doing a bit of photography at school, that's sort of how I started and all that and it wasn't actually till I it was about when I got to the Grand Hotel that I started thinking I love to do a bit of that sort of stuff. So that was sort of where I started learning. I had been taking photos a bit, but it was where I started thinking of actually taking photos of bands and stuff. And I had this big dream that I was going to become a rock photographer and all that. 
but um, I was pretty shy, so it didn't help really. But you know, at the same time now I've got images that that are precious in a way. You know, not many people were taking photos back then really, because. I was just taking photos of bands and all that, but you don't really think about, oh, down the track, one day this might mean something. As you see from these angles, I've tried to, you know, get down low shots or high shots, and I'd probably stood on, you know, that's just to be able to, to take in encompassing of, of getting everybody, you know, I would do it from different angles. Mm. So that's, it's not just the band, it's mm. taking in the, the crowd as well. Because I, th I really thought that's what made up the whole um, atmosphere of the grand. It wasn't just the band. The band was obviously the focal point that drew everyone in there. But I thought it was about the crowd as well. You know, it was just like, it wasn't one of those places where they had security, when people, if someone was out of hand and they'd be dragging them off or barring them from the place or, or you know, or you couldn't get in because of the way you were dressed or whatever. And um, other venues at the time would have been yeah, you know, your lifesaver or, or others like that. It wasn't the intimacy that the Grand had. Mm. And I mean, there was no stage at the Grand. Mm. They're all on the same level as, as the audience. So you felt connected straight away with, with the band. The camera was one of those little instamatic Hammonexes with, um, with a 110 film. And uh, I actually pinched it off my brother. He won it on a chocolate wheel at, at the school carnival. <laughs> But it used to take great photos <laughs> and it was small enough that I could just sort of hang it, you know, stick it in my pocket or in my jacket. It wasn't, it wasn't pre-thought of at all, it was just snaps, I was just taking happy snaps. But as it evolved, I guess I went from being quite shy and on the edges to getting out there and being a bit more loud and and making myself a bit more known and <laughs> um, running around with the camera. It was more a matter of get the camera out of my face. You know. Yeah, you go away. A couple of my favourite ones, one of them was used for the Not So Humdrum album, Aberrant album. And I took that on Elizabeth Street there, where the old Hyde Park Hotel is, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was meant to be a shot of their backs walking away. and. Stuart just turned around, jumped up in the air like a spider monkey, and I caught it. <laughs> Another one, which is in the back of a car, uh, driving down to Bathurst. I've got Rob Crasty, Mark Easton, and Ray again. Beer cans in hand, black nail polish on their hands, laughing, and the, and the road, <laughs> I think, you know, the highway in the background. That just sums up the camaraderie and the, and the fun that we had and we could just at a moment's notice bands were playing in Bathurst or they were playing in Canberra or they were playing in Newcastle and everybody would pile into everyone's cars and just drive off and you'd sleep in the car or you'd sleep on the step of the venue or wherever it was that you were. <laughs> we moved around a great deal. I moved, we lived in you know country New South Wales and um, country Victoria and then we moved to Groot Island when I was 10 and we lived there till I was 15, or two days before my 15th birthday, and then got dragged to Sydney, which I absolutely, I, I hated the place. And I just felt like such a fish out of water. I was so unhappy and like I, I kept thinking, all right, I'll, when my parents divorced and you know, all these big changes happened, I thought, right, I'll get a job and I'll save up and I'll run back to the Northern, you know, I'll go back to the Northern Territory. And all of a sudden I saw punks. You know, I remember seeing these guys with coloured hair and just thinking, this is the best. Before that, I was, was taking a lot of shots on the streets of Sydney and things like that. I did think with some of the photos, I am taking a photograph of a street scene in 1976, 77, 78, 79, whatever. Mm. This is, I'm just recording this, this is, this. I don't know, I didn't think it would be, I was doing it for me, I didn't think I was doing it for any wider audience, but just it was like being able to breathe again. I was shooting the stuff probably so that I could process it and we could all have a look at it. That actually used to get done up here in Annandale, which is really bizarre. It's now a block of, um, you know, lifestyle apartments. Um, that used to be Kodak processing plant 
And if you actually took it there, you could get it back the next day. I remember how I had to treat that footage. You know, it's so different with video. You know, you can just, you know, roll it. Super 8, you know, it's just, oh. You know, because you've got three minutes. You know, you, you, I, you know, would just trigger it, you know, like, it was sort of more like a camera, a, a still camera. I'm sure in all the footage that I've, you know, that you've got, that I've shot, it's, it's probably reasonably choppy, I'd say. I mean, I haven't looked at it, but it, because it was, you know, like, a roll of Super 8 film was probably something like $15, which was a lot of money. And, well, it felt like a hell of a lot of money to me. And it was even more if it had a sound stripe on it. And quite often I didn't have a, a, a camera that had a, a sound recording ability on it. So there's a whole lot of Grand Hotel stuff that's just got the images. I never felt any sense of, you know, I'm documenting a significant phenomena. You know, it means that you've lost the connection with it if it becomes like, oh, this is, yeah, I'm documenting something. I, I really stupidly thought movies came from kind of like a, such an elite, and of course they did, from Mount Olympus, from demigods made movies. No, I, there was no idea that a boy, girl from a gutter housing commission could make movies too. If anyone said to you what you're going to be when you grow up and you said artist, they'd look at you like you're a fucking idiot. But in about 78, 77, 78, I had this friend in Sydney and he put this wonderful thing in my hands called a Super 8 camera. And he said, you too can make film with this rather cheap device. And I shot it off in various directions. And I looked at the rushes and I thought, yeah, well, the film that comes out of a Super 8 camera is pretty damn good. I mean, in the squats where I lived, both Darlinghurst and Piermont, there were bands lived there too. And I saw their style and how they put it together, you know, <clears throat> their amplifiers, etc., all sticky taped and all the rest. Garage band, no money, but still making pretty interesting creative sounds and I thought you know that doesn't only have to apply to um, music it could be filmmaking too you know I could be a garage filmmaker so <clears throat> and no one considered punk culture worthy enough actually to look at it seemed the best was you got those sh shock coverage in the Daily Terror you know nasty punk break windows and shoplift stories so um I decided to just film what was around me because they looked colourful and fun and um, like when I went and filmed Rejects playing in the Grand Hotel, <clears throat> Rejects sang a song, Who Wants to March When You Can Riot? And that kind of um, philosophy <laughs> really appealed to me, I really liked that. <laughs> have a camera in those days was not an easy thing to have one and to hold on to it. So I, it just happened that luckily that night I got a camera and I go to the Grand and Rejects were playing and there were fun looking punks around the hotel and I go into the pool room and it, you know, it was, I should have, I mean now I look back on it, I should have really done it more professional, so cold and slicker and, but I did it punk and it's interesting for that too, right? I didn't even know what I was doing, actually, <laughs> quite honestly. I didn't quite know what I was doing. When the scabs finished, there was a period where nothing happened at the Grand, and then it started again, and like we completely lost control of that place, and that was a good thing. I wasn't sure how I was going to do it or <clears throat> what the job really entailed, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I 
book the bands for what that was worth because I think mostly just people just said, you know, can you play this week? Yes. Well, we'll go on before you and you can go on before them and, you know. And then other bands would come. I remember other bands would come to the Grand and bring their portfolio and stuff. <laughs> and basically I would look at them and say, no. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> and so oh, I think mostly just <laughs> that whole community that we had going there with, you know, so many bands in amongst it just kept playing there, you know. If there was a spot, there was always someone to fill it. There's a room in everybody's record collection for the New York Dolls and Blue Oyster Cold. But it seemed like a lot had been drawn in the sand and the Sex Pistols and the English bands had something going for them that was was fresh. They didn't have any, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, I said the best of my knowledge at the time, they'd all come fully formed exactly the way they were and there wasn't any history of we used to be in some boogie band and then were this, except for Joe Strummer, but then again, we always... Yeah, so we held that against it mm -hmm. because we actually thought you, you're either, either you were brand new and fresh you couldn't have been in any other band. It had to be your first band, had to be your first experience. You had, it had to be, your, you know, it couldn't just be, oh, here's what we did before, and now we're just going to do it again differently and call it punk, mm. which was what seemed to be a lot of that, what those, pe those people were doing. I mean, the old crowd was just, you know, normal, dull normal, and lived normal lives apart from the gigs. Whereas for us, it was a lifestyle, it was a commitment. It was 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you wanted to do it as a grab, it started as Johnny Dole and the Scabs just using it for promotion, you know, with no punks there, but just a lot of people who got the vibe and wanted to be involved, to a recognition that it was a punk scene, right? And had its own body, like people that hung around for a while and the grand clothes opened up again. A lot of the same people turned up, right? So it was like a family and new people came in. And that phase was the best phase. I went to boarding school. Um, and then I got expelled from boarding school. And um, I went and did my final year of the HS, well, my HSC at uh, the local high school in my town, Glen Innes. And um, that's where I met Ross. He'd been, in, he left school in fourth form or something and um, went off and did some other things. I think he worked on a cattle boat to China and back. And then when, when school finished, we, be, we moved to Sydney. My mother had always taken me to Sydney on holidays and you know, she loved it and that rubbed off on me, so. Ross's brother came back from London, Ross's older brother, with his wife. And um, they had the Clash album. And um, that was it, really. They played that for us and I was just gone from that second. I thought, that's it. That's so great, you know, it's just really... I grew up in um, Fig Tree, and um, which is just outside of Wollongong. First time I heard punk rock was the term punk rock was on a TV program. It came out in about November '76, just after Sex Pistols, um, Anarchy in the UK single came out in the UK, and there's this sort of like shock horror, blah blah blah, and. Um, um, yeah, I remember hearing that and that was something else that was, um, <laughs> that was like, um, hallelujah, I've seen the light, hallelujah. <laughs> so how did I pursue that? Next morning, straight down to David Jones, $1.10 on the counter, find me the single, play it <laughs> over and over and over again. <laughs> That's how I pursued it. <laughs> <laughs>
with a vengeance. <laughs> no, no, I didn't didn't feel like I had to change at all. I just, you know, like it had just. Um, you, I just felt identified with it, you know, like I just felt immediately like this is. This is. I, I could relate to it immediately, you know, it's like falling in love, you just, you know, it's, it's, bang. Well, Bob was looking for a new band after Filth, and for some reason, I don't know, we sort of started hanging around together. One of the big advantages we had um, over a lot of the bands is um, having Andy as a singer, because there was still, like, um, boy thing going. Like, I seem to remember... Um, a general night at the Grand was um, was um, an eighty twenty split, um, but certainly as Gorilla gigs developed, um, it became more sort of like a fifty fifty split. We ended up getting Johnny Gunn for drummer. We went out to a ride to to hear him, and he lived out there in a flat with his parents, and he had a really tiny bedroom and and a really tiny drum kit. <laughs> and I remember him coming to the first rehearsal at Bob's place, which was a whole floor of a big warehouse down on Wentworth Avenue called Mansion House. And coming in and he just, I don't know, he couldn't believe his eyes, I don't think. It didn't matter that it was ephemeral. The moment was important. The, the joy of it was important. Well, that's how I kind of felt and, you know, like... Uh, I, I think you sort of like think posterity will take care of itself. <laughs> and the only the only recordings of the Irving Reelers were either done in in rehearsal by us and with a microphone somewhere nearby on a chair, or you know <laughs> live recordings. <laughs> Recorded at the back of the room, you know, right behind everybody who was jumping up and down and dancing on a, you know, ghetto blaster. <laughs> Fabulous quality. <laughs> I regret, I, I really regret that none of that stuff was recorded. Um, Why didn't the other girls record? We didn't think like that. We, well, everybody else was thinking in terms of commercial, and the Urban Gorillas, maybe maybe other people did in the band, but to my mind, it's just we played, we did these songs, and 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 the actual point of the moment then seem to be live performance and the the relationship between performer and an audience and um, posterity seemed sort of like absurd you know like and, and unlikely I don't know why we didn't record perhaps you know, perhaps if we'd stayed together here a bit longer, we might have, we might have got around to it. But, you know, that was, it was such a short period of time, really. When you think about it, the amount of, you know, it was only a couple of years, you know, and that's nothing, really. I mean, it was big, and I, and I remember it as, you know, some of the best years of my life, but you know, and some of the most fun, definitely the most fun, and, you know, happiest and most comfortable, you know. I really enjoyed that time. But, you know, so it was a shame that we didn't record because, you know, we had great songs, we had, you know, we were a great band. <laughs> See, are you a member of the Communist Party? No. It's fun. Anything like that? No. I'm for anything that's going to destroy the system. I mean, obviously, politically, it was Goff getting ousted, and you know, he's voted in, and then he's booted out, and Liberals came in again. 
had 23 years of them and they're back in again. Uh, wasn't it? It was, what, 23 mm -hmm. years and then Labor came in on the golf and he, he made a great change. That was an amazing thing. He stopped the Vietnam thing straight away, so that's it. Was wanted in any way, but he stopped it and brought him home, and and he immediately put up the welfare from ten bucks to thirty bucks a week. You know, mm. I remember single mothers in the country were, you know, ten bucks a week, and they'd have to go to the cop shop to get their money, mm. and uh, then the, the the cop would hand over the money, just like oh here's your you know mm. derogatory, you know, being really. Uh, Humili you know, humiliating them, so here's your 10 bucks, what are they going to check? I mean, it was only 71 when, you know, Greer's book was written, Female Eunuch, and I think that had a lot of influence on people in Australia. Um, and I think that was a real turning point, I think, for a lot of people. Because she, she put things fairly plainly about how things were for, for women. I think probably perhaps people in the punk music scene, they weren't really involved in mm. politics as such on, on a outward basis. Um, but there were also, it, was, it seemed to be, well from my point of view, it, it, it seemed to sort of coalesce and there was a, a, a junction between all those political ideas and, and punk. Well I think that's, that scene was quite different to the archetypal punk scene in London. I think we probably were more um, uh, complex in our politics than the London model. Uh, we, we were struggling to find out what it was that we were for and against. We weren't clones of the Sex Pistols. In fact, the Sex Pistols were probably one of the bands that didn't, weren't really one of our inspirations. I mean, we, yeah, sure, they were great, but we were much more likely to be uh, less I, it's funny to say it, but less commercial. I think it was more subverting fashion and subverting what everybody else thought of punk. You know, I, I think that the, arguably there'd be quite a lot of people who are very committed politically. Um, I guess I was more involved in the, the feminist sort of movement. I was involved in setting up the rape cri one of the people who was involved in the rape crisis centre. That was probably 76, 77, 75 maybe. Um, I was quite involved with the anarchist movement. Um, I didn't live at the anarchist bookshop. There was an anarchist bookshop on the corner of Glebe Point and um, whatever the other big crossroad in Glebe is. It's now a, a posh restaurant. And um, quite a few people I knew lived at the Anarchist Bookshop. And that's, I guess, I think I met Lee Kendall through, through that, that scene. You know, yeah, well, look, I think yeah, the point I was going to make was that I think the connection between anarchism and punk music is, comes from, um, you know, anarchy in the UK. And the, the, also, not just that, but the involvement of Malcolm McLaren, who was previously involved in you know, you could say situationist groups. Uh, indeed, some of the graphics on the punks, on those Sex Pistol singles were lifted from, well, one was actually lifted from a pamphlet right, that was made in San Francisco, right? So people who knew about that recognised that, right? So I guess in some ways, within the, within the anarchist milieu, uh, there's been an interest in punk music from that point of view. And it seems to have persisted, at least in, in the UK, and to maybe a lesser extent here, through like Crass, where punk music becomes associated with, however you want to call it, you know, uh, some people call it anarchist, some people call it autonomous. I think even though I joined the Communist Party, probably at heart I was much more of an anarchist always, because there were things I bit my tongue about quite a lot for, for the sake of towing the party line. Mm. I was introduced to Marxist feminism and I was introduced to all these ideas and I got a shock when I came to Sydney because there was all these people who were kind of, you know, sort of, they didn't want to hear about politics. That politics, I guess, was one more thing to um, be thrown away and it wasn't worth expending energy on. Yeah.
but I made friends with a lot of people here and I uh, got on really well with a lot of people. There was just a, a couple of households of people and I think there was a couple of individuals that exerted quite a lot of influence in those households that, that um, objected to the fact that we wore hammers and sickles and our leather jackets and things like that. Yeah, well you couldn't be into politics and you, and you couldn't be serious. And it was the humour that was, that was the most important aspect of the whole thing and that's what they lost later on. They started getting serious and political. And I think once that happened, once, once, once it stopped being funny, it just stopped being punk, you know. And then the basic premise was that it was totally corrupt and evil, you know, the establishment. There was nothing we could do about it, so we might as well just have a good time, <laughs> you know. And I still believe that's the best philosophy. With some of the crew that I was hanging around with, some have gone on um, to fairly successful careers in business. Uh, and. They may have had an anarchy symbol on their shirt in the punk days, but it certainly doesn't reflect their lifestyle today. Um, but the anarchy thing was a little bit of a symbol of youth, uh, rebelling against parental and governmental control. Uh, and to a degree as well, um, thumbing the law. At the time, punks looked pretty weird, <laughs> you know, to the average copper. And I guess that maybe aroused their curiosity, you know. Uh, but yeah, there was, let's say, more than the usual share of attention. They didn't know, they didn't know what we were about, you know. They were, I think, worried about what we were going to do next, you know. So, and they had, they didn't have any historical, you know, data to, to call and go, okay these guys do this or they follow that or those guys are okay, you know. I guess they were, they were looking at us and saying now, are these, you know, equivalent to bikies, you know, are they going to be doing the same sort of things or what, you know. My grandfather was actually a, a policeman. Uh, he was a police inspector and, and actually set up the, the D squad. Um, so, <laughs> um, I don't, I'm not saying that I had protection, you know, because I could say, oh, my granddad, blah, blah, blah. But, I, you know, if, if, if a policeman came up and spoke to me or told me something, I, I knew how to talk to them. And they just go, oh, OK. And they leave you alone. You just, yeah, just, but where other people, the you know, policeman were approaching, they go, oh, you fuck, you know. And um, then they get taken off. You know, I knew when to shut up. Mm. I mean, a fair bit of graffiti used to go on. Some of it related to music, some of it political, uh, but a lot of it went on around Darlinghurst, that area. Um, and I recall where one time somebody had spray painted, which seems pretty juvenile and silly, but had spray painted, pick your bum. Uh, and this, this was painted over and fixed up within like four hours, which I was amazed. Uh, and because exactly the same place, somebody had put spray painted, why kill time, question mark, kill cops instead. And that stayed up for like months and months and months. And I thought, it's a funny old world, you know? I don't know about Britain or, or the United States, but here, I think it's very much a cultural thing. Uh, we're kind of educated in the history of the colony. Uh, uh, things like Vinegar Hill and Eureka Stockade. Uh, so it's, it's pretty much universal in this country. The coppers are there to be slagged off. So I don't think the punks have got a purchase on that. It wasn't that Everyone was a total anarchist against everything that was, you know, um, society, etc. It just wasn't like that. But everyone basically wanted to do their own thing, were quite happy to do it with a group of people, be that just going to a band or going to the grand. And there was no pressure. Um, if you didn't want to do this, see you later. None whatsoever. So, so there was no formal structure to it at, at all, or well, none that I can see. No, well, I think anarchy is valid. Mm. I think it's a valid political state. I don't, I don't, um, 
I don't think anarchy equals chaos. I mean, chaos by its nature can't be in control. Right? I'm talking Aboriginal societies, tribal societies, who live largely at peace and, and, and with the environment and with themselves. I don't believe you need a society or a hierarchy or a leviathan at all. You know, if it's about, if it's about something that's anti-capitalist, uh, capitalism is compulsory and resignations aren't accepted. And if you don't want to be totally, if you want to remain totally pure and keep well away from all the dirty, nasty things in the world, you could move out into the country and you grow your own food and be totally self-dependent. But whose land are you on? I mean, perhaps I think if maybe if you if you'd um, grown up as an Aboriginal person in in Australia, I think you'd have totally other things go, going on. I mean, perhaps much more important political issues going on. I don't recall there being in the punk scene much of a connection. No. <laughs> but as, as, as a lecturer at, at an art college said to me, this is this 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 is the last white revolt in Australia. No. Donald Horne, who wrote uh, The Lucky Country, was um, my lecturer in political science in 1975 at New South Wales Uni. And um, uh, I understood what he was trying to get at with that book, and I wanted to sort of comment on that in that song. <laughs> I just did it in a really clumsy way, but it looked good as a title, a song called Lucky Country. And, um, you know, I'm embarrassed by the lyric now, but... Um, what is the lyric? What, what the I lyric? try not to think of it, you know, right. but um, I was trying to rhyme something, so I ended up with this line about watch Australia die, because it rhymed with something else, and, like, Australia wasn't about, obviously about to die, but I was, well, I was, you know, I was just trying to make a point about the lucky country, like, it's not the lucky country, and it's... The way people use that expression is incorrect, and I was trying to say, well, you know, it's, for a lot of people, it's not a lucky country. By then, everybody was doing songs like, like Saints had done Australia, bloody um, Scabs had done Lucky Country. Um, no Allegiance was once again about government and the overthrow of government. It wasn't specific. Yeah, oh, that was about um, alle no allegiance to, to the Queen, no allegiance, you know to the country. <laughs> sort of backpedal a bit I think these days about that that whole sort of RSL war thing and 
from time to time I come across people who even regret their sort of anti RSL, anti Anzac Day stance, you know. Um, punks were anti violence, anti racist. I, you know, that's that's the way I remember it. They say you're not old, but you that are left so old. I tell no more than you can get. At the time now, the sun and in the morning, we will remember them, lest we forget. Uh, Jack and I wrote that. Um, it was an excellent song. And it, was, it probably started because I worked in an RSL for about 20 years, or about 10 years or so, just behind the bar. And we would, we would regularly, well, regularly is not quite the right word, but we would be there a, a reasonable amount because it was nice and cheap to drink there anyway and because I worked there. Great, great billiard but, tables. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I guess the uh, certainly all the old drunks that were there <laughs> sort, yeah. of, sort of got up Jack and, Jack and Tom's nose a little bit every now yeah. and then and we were the yeah rah, piss off get, get out of our club yeah sort of situation so that's probably where it came from a little <laughs> yeah I, I remember the words but, yeah yeah, yeah it was, so it's basically saying that oh you know think men were men back then and all this sort of thing and yeah royal to the crown and all that and um so yeah, it's it's just a bit of a um, an attack at the establishment, you could say. <laughs> In essence, it was you know kids just talking about or you know expressing how they were feeling, and that's what that's what I loved about it. It was a real heartfelt, gutsy vibe. That was that was the thing I loved about it. In those days, anybody any punk who wore a flag, with the possible exception of the Australia Street. Punks, which was most of the rejects of those guys, um, they they had they had a flag outside the house as an ironic National Front orientated flag. Whereas the only other people who genuinely had the flag for real were National Front, were the Skins and all those people. And it's well documented what happened to those guys. And um, the flag was the last thing you'd want. It was you know we were supposed to be you're supposed to be against the state. Well, we actually had a song called Australia. Born in Australia, what else can you do? So far away, away from the news. Do nothing but wait, 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 wait. Do nothing at all. This is Australia. Not about my today. Not my. I remember it wasn't very flattering of Australia um, and I wasn't very flattering of Australia at that time. I was very negative, you know, I was a migrant. I always thought back home, you know, back home was better and um, until I went back home. I remember in, 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 in the school where, where I was, um, basically um, immigrants from Britain were particularly um, seized upon and, and, and punished because um, uh, Mediterranean immigrants, they couldn't help what they were, but a pom could be turned into a good Australian with enough beatings. <laughs> you would think if you're walking to a place in that period of time and it's all full of, you know, hardcore punks, it's going to be a really, you know, intense, uh, you know, intimidating place. Well, it wasn't. It, it wasn't like that at all. It was. It was really inviting and, um, you know, nobody caused anybody in trouble. Not that I can remember. I, I'm, look, I'm sure somebody didn't like somebody, but um, that's just human nature. But, you know, it was, for, for me, it was sort of like instant acceptance both ways, you know, and um, that was it. Nothing was ever said more about it. It didn't need to be said. I can still remember how I even found the Grand, um, which was out 
I was actually living in an orphanage at the time, but they used to let you out on the weekends. And uh, so I used to go and see bands, obviously. Oh, and they're all rubbish at the time. But uh, I had to walk up to Central Station to get a train home. It was, it was at Ashfield, this place. I was actually walking along the ground. There was a handwritten piece of paper in the window. It had punk bands. And I can't remember if it was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Friday, Saturday, so, or whatever it was, but it was a couple of days. And I went that, that weekend. I thought, ah, I'm home. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's just sort of a scene I found that I could, seem to be I could fit in, I guess. I was an outsider and, you know, more of a, a, a loner or whatever. And um, maybe that's where all the other ones turned up in a sense, you know. I mean, didn't get on with everyone. Back then it was probably, what, 200 people that you knew by sight. It doesn't mean that you were friends with all of them. Of course we weren't. But uh, I had a job and I had my own money, so I was self-sustained. And you just probably wanted to, you know, meet a, meet a girl that you got on with. It you love and hopefully love you and that sort of thing and um, yeah I didn't do bands and that because I was more a visual artist I guess. Mm. Um, what did I want out of it? I don't know, you yeah, just friends because I didn't have, I guess yeah you make some friends because I didn't have any initially because I was from out of town, I just was my, it was a big city back then, it's a small town now. My father was a Jewish refugee. And, you know, when he came to Australia, he did financially really well, but he'd lost everything in coming to Australia to escape, you know, losing his life. He, he got here with his father and his sister and they struggled and, you know, got a good life together. But um, I think I inherited that um, grief and anger and trauma from my father. And I, it's almost embarrassing to sort of own up to that. But, you know, that's something that um, I would not be surprised has been a significant part of the formation of my childhood and my adulthood. And, you know, that set me on a trajectory of... Um, anger and being outside of, you know, of a comfortable, accepted place in society. And so I, I very, very clearly remember that when punk came along, I felt, I felt a comfort in the collision of a whole lot of things that happened. I mean, people would say it's a gang nowadays, but it was a clan of people that had the same, we all had something in common, so it made that family feel. Mm. We all stuck together, had each other's back, and that's how it was. Someone got in jail, we all bailed them out, or if you weren't fighting the cops yourself. <laughs> and I went to a, t a few different high schools, I didn't like school much and um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I just thought I was going to get a job. And then um, there was a guy called Pierre and he was going to the Grand Hotel when he was about, like, I don't know, 15 or something, 16. We thought, that's pretty cool, so he told us to come. And we went there and that was it. And then I ended up moving above the Grand Hotel. I had those, um, there's one room. You know, the first floor was a massage parlour, second floor and third floor were uh, rooms and then you can go right up top of the roof. That was pretty cool. It was a place where, personally, I no longer had to be violent, a violent member of a, a street gang. Not that I was, but that was my ambition. Nor did I have to um, be a thief or, or I didn't have to break into houses like my friends. And I was kind of, I was kind of freed from all of that. I was freed from from those things that I didn't even know were constraints. So to be able to, to put my energies somewhere else was really, was really liberating, liberating from, from what could have happened. 
what we were doing, what the gram was doing, was already after, was already after punk. Even though we yeah. thought we were being punk, mm -hmm. or they thought we were being punk, we thought we were on the edge of punk or whatever. It was already after, and you know, but at the same time, and a whole bunch of different people around the world, everywhere, and maybe this is just being young, I don't know, being young and being into that sort of scene, sort of believed that there was something really special about that sign of um, bringing together of music and cultural expression, which was new and different and going to change the world in some way, not necessarily in a revolutionary way, but it was almost sort of, you know, it was a sort of quasi-religious kind of belief in the power of that kind of music, culture, mix. Well, I'm not saying it was powerful because of who was involved or, or what bands were playing or anything else. A ritual, what makes a ritual powerful is the amount of belief, right? And that's what made our ritual so powerful, because everybody involved totally believed in what was there, even though everyone had their own take on it. It wasn't a ritual. And the Grand Hotel was an intense ritual, but it wasn't a ritual that supported something. It was a ritual that negated everything and threw away everything. And it was so powerful, it was absolute freedom. To me, that experience was an experience of annihilation of the self, of, of, of you know, what I knew to be me, and uh, that, that mystical experience, and, and it's pretty much certainly what we tried to do, <laughs> you know, without perhaps giving it those, that, that name. There was certainly, you know, no sense of self-preservation or, or, or being sensible about the way I lived my life. and, and uh, in the early days when I was practicing yoga and meditation, you know, the first things I came across were the ascetic sort of approach to doing that, mm. which is about, you know, a lot of yeah. those a lot of those forms of yoga are about about self mutilation and abuse and about so, you know, the, the idea of being really hard on yourself and really harsh on yourself in order to achieve some sort of spiritual awakening is is not it was not alien to me. The only thing that could exist in that space was that moment and that energy and that was it. You didn't bring anything with you. <laughs> you didn't take anything out. You just went in there and let everything go. I grew up in Wollongong and, you know, there was no punk scene happening in Wollongong at all that I knew of. And anyhow, there was just me and this, there was just, there were three mates from school. It was me, Con Murphy, who was the original bass player in the Suicide Squad, and Mick, uh, what was his name? Mick Adams, that's right. We were on a train one night, either going, I think we were coming home from a gig. We jumped in this carriage on this train, and there was this dude, and I thought, wow. Another punk, you know, it's cool. And then I just started talking to this guy and he goes, Oh, I'm I'm Bob Short. He said, just go down to this place called the Grand Hotel, get a gig there. We went down there and Chaos were playing. And we got there and there was about two people in the room and everybody was else was in the bar. And straight away I thought, This is the place. You know, and because we'd been going to the Civic and we saw X up there and we saw lots of different bands at the time and nothing really rang true for what we wanted. And then when we got down there, we went, yeah, this is it. And I went up to the guys in Chaos after and I said, oh, you know, we're in this band from Wollongong. And they said, oh, come up and support us next week. And so I said, all right. So we came up and I remember we set up and I'm pretty sure the room was pretty much empty when we went on. It was nobody in the room. Nobody knew who we were. And then we just launched into it. And I've always had a very heavy handed approach to playing guitar. And it was, I remember I was really nervous. I, I, I didn't even want to look up because I was so nervous. My hands were shaking. Anyhow, I was sort of looking down. Next thing I looked up, the room was full. I was like, what? Couldn't believe it, it was great. And I remember the, the first thing I, you know, the, 
all I could see was people's faces and beers being pushed. And people were just giving me free beers, you know, and we were all pissed as farts by the end of the show. But it was such a great vibe. And then, you know, like afterwards, it was just like all these people just became our lifelong friends, and they still are. <laughs> I came across Suicide Squad. They were playing at the Grand on Broadway. They were playing in a back room there, and I, I, was, I went to that, and I ended up meeting Mark and Con, and they had another lead singer that they weren't really happy with, and I'd learnt singing in my younger years. I'd learnt opera, um, classical singing, for many years. Um, I used to go every day after school to Mrs Toussaint, the piano teacher, and I used to do the la 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 la, and you know, and I used to sing in a Steadfords, and Mum used to put my hair in pigtails, and I used to get up there and, you know, sing songs about fairies dancing through the woods and stuff like that. And so I somehow remember meeting Mark and Con, and for, I just ended up being the singer of their band without even a trial or anything. And I used to catch the train to Wollongong to practice at the the Wollongong CWA Hall on a Thursday night. And I was working for Ribald magazine, a porn magazine, um, in the art department. So I was doing that during the day and then I was singing in Suicide Squad at night. I mean, really for me, I wanted, I wanted to be, I wanted to be in a band. I wanted to be a rock singer, you know? I call it heavy rock, I don't call it punk. Because really, you know, I suppose it was just the, uh, the songs were just faster mm. and screeched mm. louder. We were very lucky that we got away with what we got away with. Mm. We put ourselves in so much danger as women as well, mm. fronting up to men and walking the streets alone. Mm. You know, you had to be as off as possible mm. in all situations. Mm. Mm. You know, even mm. if we were lying on a blanket in the park down at Sydney Harbour, you know, one of those parks we all used to go down to on blankets. You couldn't just sit there and like, you know, relax and you'd be rolling around and wrestling and, you know, <laughs> head butting and squirting, you know, cask wine at each other and spitting and, you know, it was, it was street theatre. We were angry. We were, you know, it was, you, you know, like, we were angry, you know. We were against the government mm. and it was anarchy and, you know, it was, we weren't happy with anything. Mm. You know, that's, but we weren't, we were pretending. Mm. <laughs> but that, that's, that's my interpretation mm. of, of, from what I could gather, it was just, from what I can gather, it was a trend. Mm. I mean, I'm probably insulting a few people by <laughs> saying that. But from what I could gather, it, it was a trend. Mm. I don't know, look, I was... In my teens, I was looking for something to, you know, I was looking for a soundtrack to the way I was feeling about life and, and it just was the right music at the right time. And and it just was really just what I needed. And basically, it gave me, I guess it gave you a uniform in some ways, you know, you, you know, and that, you know, even though we like to think that we weren't, you know, we were individuals. It gave us a uniform, and we were like, it was like being in New Kids Army. It was like an army. You were in these uniforms. You had all these, you know, punks in Brisbane and punks in there was punks in every city. And when you, you know, you go to a different city, and straight away you were adopted into that city. <laughs> There was definitely an exodus, uh, and you know I, I remember being in, in, living in squats in London, where gee whiz, half the people came from Sydney. Um, yeah, so that was kind of interesting in that regard. Uh, there was a number of people from the Sydney scene, you know, around that scene, who uh, ended up in London. 
well, the reason we'd gone there was to get away from here. So I guess we thought it was, you know, we thought it was great and, you know, we were really enjoying ourselves because, you know, we were in our element. We could, oh, well, we could see all those bands and we could hang out and it, it was just all happening there. But, you know, you miss, we missed the people, you know, that were here and, but I, the general, the general idea, the general sort of consensus that people had, I think, was that there wasn't a great deal going on here and that it wasn't really going anywhere. And so I don't think we missed it terribly. We were gone for good. I mean, that was our plan. We had no intention of coming back. We all bought one-way tickets. The funny thing was, the punk scene, I guess, was as big in New York. But um, have you ever heard of anyone then from that scene who thought, I'll go to New York and do it? No, that didn't happen. Nobody was wanting to go to New York. It was actually everybody that we saw off at the um, Sydney International Airport was going to London. You know, there was just this series of goodbyes at the airport where everybody from the Grand went out to the airport and said goodbye to whoever was going on that day. I'm not sure why I went to London. Um, uh, Johnny Dole had gone to London and um, he rang me up a few months later and said, hey, you know, come over and we'll play music, you know. And I don't know why I went, because I'd just sort of met this girl and um, I had a girlfriend. And, but because I said I'd go, I'd, I went. I don't know what I was expecting to do. And Bob Short came along. And so it was me and Coz and Bob Short and Johnny Dole and it was, you know, it was just stupid. There was culture shock, you know, you go to this massive city and my only reference of, of a city was Sydney, you know, and it doesn't work in London. And um, um, it was great uh, as an educational sort of trip to go and see all these great bands I'd always wanted to see, you know, the Buzzcocks and the Clash and the Jam and all these great bands, that was great fun, but um, it, you know, in hindsight, it was a really dumb thing to do because it was a really great scene in Sydney. I mean, I remember walking down the street in London, like not long after I got there, seeing a huge billboard with a guy with a mohawk shaving his head with a Remington. You know, Remington's shavers, although that's when it's finished, you know, when they're advertising it to you and selling you electric razors. To be a punk, an Australian punk, that in London was, um, it was just a no-no. It was like, we couldn't say we were Australian. Um, and I think that was probably a lot to do with what the Saints come up against and, and, you know, it got easier as the years went on when the punk scene faded a bit. But, you know, the London scene was very elite. You know, there, there was that sort of eliteness about it. I never felt like a, an Australian, like, okay, like, I was born in England, I came over here, I went back over there, blah, blah, blah. I actually got on there much better uh, with people. Um, I found people much more politically on the same wavelength as me. Um, lots of people were very freaked out by how, you know, like the squalor of it and everything like that. And to me, the squalor, the squalor was fun. I didn't give a shit. It was electric. It was it was so exciting. There were bands playing on every pub corner, you know. There were punks everywhere. The whole scene, it looked like it was, was made just for the punk culture. It was so, it was just, it was just so alive. I was travelling on my own. I went to lots of gigs, you know, really late. Went out to see The Clash in Aylesbury. Uh, took it, the, it's a little town in Buckinghamshire, you know, like something out of one of those English shows, just green hills and lots of sheep. And this town was overtaken by punks. I got off the train from London in Aylesbury and I was a bit scared because I was overwhelmed, you know, because I was used to the Grand and Garibaldi's and stuff like that. Here I was in, I'd travelled, you know, an hour and a half out of London on my own and there was about 4,000 punks in this little town, you know, little villages, you know, little villages just with their little, you know, baskets coming home from the local shops wondering what's happened. Obviously the London scene was much, much, much bigger. Um, but in, in some ways, if, if you wanted to look at it in terms of the impact that punk had in the UK and the impact that punk 
had in Australia on music generally, or you could say, say music, fashion and culture, uh, I think it's probably proportionate. I remember going to a gig, I think it might have been The Damned and at the Electric Ballroom, and we were meeting um, a woman who we were friends with here, and she had gone back to England because she was English. And um, we met her at the gig, uh, at a pub rather, before the gig. And she, when we walked into the pub, it was full of skinheads. And we just, you know, <laughs> we were terrified. <laughs> it was just wall to wall skinheads. And there were some large ones sort of leaning across the doorway. And, you know, you had to, we had to sort of go under their arms because they didn't move. They just sort of, you know. And we were there sort of looking fabulous. And um, she was in the middle in this, you know, sort of lounge bar area. And she was with all these skinheads. And, and she said, oh, it's all right, it's all right. These are my friends from Australia, you know. And, um, and they all, because they were all up like this, and then they just all sort of sat down. You know, because, you know, we were Australians, we were from the colonies, so we were okay. <laughs> It, I suppose it's, it's significant for, firstly, a larger cultural reason in that it is probably one of the last moments when something that was happening substantially in London just was instantly adopted in Australia. I don't mean generally, of course, it was a small scene in London and it was a small scene in Australia. But fascinating how it just was absorbed by osmosis. We started doing, thinking, feeling um, the same sorts of things. And that had happened in Australia since 1788. And I think it probably last happened truly in about 1976, 77. What was going on in England was one thing, but we didn't, weren't, you know, that was going on in terms of the same conjunction. So what we were doing was obviously, we obviously, there was some sort of a worldly idea about what punk should be, but we're all creating it. It wasn't like something, it's not retro. It's not looking back at something. We were part of something. I think it was a much smaller scene and, and it was totally opposite to England in that they got publicity, it was all publicity, it was all in the press constantly, right? And that was the whole thing, was a press sort of outrageousness. In Sydney, we were totally ignored by the media and they had no idea what it was anyway. And as I was saying before, the ritual was very internal and intense. So I don't think the effects were any less dramatic. I just don't think it's as obvious or as documented because the media wasn't involved. So you don't have all that stuff. Right? All you have is us and our stories. Oh, mm -hmm. 